Our gospel for this Sunday comes to us from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, this is a continuation of the reading we heard last week. Jesus goes home to his hometown. He's been doing all kinds of things all over the place, and news is spreading. And he goes into the synagogue, and as was his custom, and then he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to read. He read this beautiful piece from Isaiah, and then we continue. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him <clears throat> and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is that there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> now, I've been getting better and getting over this, this awful cold I had. Thankfully, it was just a bad cold. Um, you had to go out and run some errands and get, you know, get stuff. And um, in one of the stores, I noticed that there was this person who was going from housewares to hardware to clothing and was going all over the place and, um, you know, picking up zippers and buttons and latches and clasps and all these strange things. And I'm you know, looking at the list and I'm like, wow, this person must really be looking for closure. Now, we all have, you know, these different things that we all have as our collections, our pet things. A friend of mine uh, has a Pez dispenser collection. And it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of cool things. And, but actually, uh, there's a, quite a following. And the, the, the Pez collectors have this kind of rule for what actually brings value to it, what brings it up. They call it its Pezness. Well, my friend has one of these, the most... And the most sought after one is Asian American comedian Margaret Cho's. Hers is the most valued one because we all know that there is no peasantess like Cho peasantess. She wrote back saying that this was an incredible honor for her because her family is very proud. And she comes from a very proud people. As you know, there is no people like Cho people. You know. When you're feeling that, okay, we'll stop that. Um, <clears throat> and just to show that I'm not just looking up silly things, I'm actually continuing my theological studies. I came across a discussion where it says that Jesus didn't own jewelry. And this has nothing to do with um, whether or not he owned a purse or anything else like that. It's quite simply because Jesus breaks every chain. Okay, I'm going to stop that before you try to throw me off of something. But that's kind of expected for those of you who know me, for those of you who are visiting, I am so sorry. It's kind of what I do. It's my own opening act. But you expect it. Those of you who have been here, you expect it. In fact, if I don't do it, I have countless people that come up to me afterwards and go, Pastor, are you okay? Now, to be honest, I had more expect you to come up to me after these jokes and go, Pastor, are you okay? The answer is no. <laughs> that should be abundantly obvious. But let's face it, we, we have expectations. We all have those kinds of things. Those experiences where you know somebody or you know a situation, you, you kind of, it's the normal, right? It's just what's expected. 
We have them in so many different ways. I mean, we have our routines and our habits and all these different things. We have our expectations and how people act and operate in various situations. And we know that when something doesn't fit, it just feels wrong, right? It just feels off. When things are not as we expected, if they are out of the norm, it just, I mean, sometimes we, we can't really put our finger on it. Sometimes it's just this unease that we have. Sometimes we really know it. And basically it deals to the fact that we don't like change. We really don't. We want to know what's expected. We want to know what's going on. We want to know where everything goes. We want it to be that way. I mean, it's the old joke. How many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Really? Mess with someone's routine. Watch how life gets very fun. But let's face it, the things that are usual, the things that we might use the word normal on, aren't always necessarily right or good, right? But they're known. We understand that. But we have difficulties when things change. If you know somebody and they start acting differently, even if it's for the better. We often struggle with how do you relate to the person who always was a certain way? How do you deal with them? And that's because within ourselves, there is this disconnect of what we expected, what we believed, what is usual, and what is now in front of us. Let's face it, folks. It's the heart of what sociologists call confirmation bias. We want to see what we want to see. We want to hear what we want to hear. Because we don't want something that's going to come at us differently. Let's face it, growing up in school, how many of you look forward to a red mark on your paper? How many of you in sports wanted your coach to yell at you because you did something wrong? Did you look forward to getting called to the principal's office or your, your supervisor's office? Those are harder examples, right? It's one thing something just kind of tweaks a little different, but when someone actually comes up to you and goes, eh, wrong, thanks for playing, that's really, really hard to deal with because we want to be confirmed. We want everything to just be the old joke. Parents aren't interested in justice. They just want quiet. Let's face it. Most of us are that way. Don't trouble us. Don't rock my boat. So is it any big surprise what happens with Jesus? I mean, he does what is normal. He goes to his hometown. But going out and about, he's already doing some healings and miracles and all these kinds of things. Word is starting to spread. People are looking forward to him with expectation. He goes to the synagogue, as was usual for him, his usual place. And he reads this wonderful piece from Isaiah about how God is going to provide and restore and let the oppressed go free. And Jesus sits down to teach him and says, this word has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they all, I mean, you notice what happens? Oops. And they were all amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. They spoke well of him. Is not this Joseph's son? They even reaffirmed their relational connection and closeness to him. And then Jesus made the biggest mistake of all. He kept talking. He fulfilled the first act of any good public speaker, and that is to build connections with the audience. And 
And then he started bringing in these other things. You expect me to do what I did elsewhere? No prophet is honored in their hometown. Oh, by the way, remember that Elijah, in the time of the famine, went to a widow in Zarephath and kept her? And in Elisha, Naaman the Syrian came and was cleansed? Now we might go, what's the big deal? Here he is sitting with his family, his extended clan, the people who knew him, good Jewish people, and he pointed out the fact that here's, after reading this wonderful passage from Isaiah that talks about release and healing and wholeness and everything else that God is going to do, good news, he points out the fact that, um, yeah, it's for them. What you've been hearing and what you thought you were hearing while you were patting yourself on the back and go, yep, that's God. God's taking good care of me. You got it. Yep, yep. God's here to do all this stuff for me. Yep, yep, yep. What do you mean those people? This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What? Wait, now he's now they're all of a sudden rethinking what he might have meant when he said this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing because now he's going on and talking about other people and these promises. Can you see why they went from, oh, this is Joseph's son speaking well of him in his gracious words to wanting to throw him off a cliff? He didn't come and tell them and confirm for them, yes, keep going on. It's okay. Because he called them to be a part of this process, and not only a part of this process, but not for themselves, for other people. You want me to what? Those people? You mean those Gentiles? Yes, those people. So what are you hearing? And what do you hear time in and time out when you come to church? When you read the scriptures? Are you reading and just hearing... Sorry, I can't do that. Is that what you're hearing? It's okay. You're all right. Don't worry about it. As Lutherans, we believe in law and gospel. And that the scriptures, even those sections we label gospel, bring both to us. Now, in seminary, I was taught this acronym. SOS. Law shows us our sin. Gospel shows us our Savior. It shows us our sin. It shows us those things when we might have to change or use that really churchy word repent when we might have to stop thinking it's all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, and I, it's about my neighbor. Is it any surprise, Jesus said, that the law was simply distilled into love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And just in case we wanted to get into this situation, we go, well, yeah, I love my neighbor. My neighbor's a nice person. Their dog, they pick up after their dog. They're not too loud and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you're supposed to love your enemy too. Darn it, caught me on that one. Yes. I have to I have to change how I engage with people? Yes. Do I have to pay attention to how I am, those things that I do and those things I left undone? Yes. You mean I'm a part of this? Yes. Jesus didn't come and go, it's all right.
Jesus did come to take care of things. But he took care, came here to take care of things by making things different. He came to show us and embody for us that gift of love, that gift of grace. Even to the Gentiles, even to the enemies, even to those that he came and showed us. That he would, and there was no end to what God was going to do to show that love. He's going to love God with all his heart, soul, and mind, and his neighbor as himself. And then he calls us to take up our cross and follow. You mean I might have to change? Yes. But as our Savior, he shows us that there is no place, no situation, nothing that we are apart from God's love. Because fundamentally what Jesus comes to do as our Savior is he affirms us. He doesn't confirm that, oh, yeah, you're okay. He comes and affirms our relationship to God that does not change. Parents, especially, maybe as a child you heard this, maybe it was hard for you to hear this as a child when it happened, but parents, maybe you had to do this. When your child did something they did wrong, and you had to come to them and explain it to them. And you had to, shall we say, give them the law. Did you also not say something or do something along the line that still was, and I still love you? You're still my child. You're still mine. We're affirmed not by what we do. We're affirmed in whose we are. We're affirmed by the one who came to love us and to lead us and to even, yes, go and die for us on the cross to show us that there was no extent to where we could be that God would not go to show God's love. And just in case we thought that meant there was an end, he rose again from the dead to go, surprise, I still love you. You are mine. And so let's remind ourselves of that. And the gifts God gave us in baptism, the proclamation God gave us in baptism, the affirmation, even so you, you repeat after me. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've been marked with the cross of Christ forever. I am Christ's. Do you hear that? Do you remember that? Can you take that with you as you take up a cross and follow? Can you realize and hear God's love that says, follow, learn, and love in the gift of love that is already given to you. And so may we go forward with these gifts of grace and show God's love, that same love that's given to us. Remember that God loves you, and so do I.